Thank you, James. Um, welcome, everyone. This is the start of our uh, workshop entitled Enhancing Your Technology Transfer. And we're going to be talking about what that means for CTED and for the Department of Transportation, as these, this is now a part of our projects and part of the mission. Uh, I hope everyone was able to join us this morning for the panel, fantastic panel. Great to hear from hear everyone and great questions. So look forward to that continuing uh, this afternoon. My name is Eileen Clements. I am a the Technology Transfer Assistant Director for CTED here at UT Arlington. I'm also the Director of Research at the UT Arlington Research Institute. So our talk today is going to go through an overview of what technology transfer is specifically for the DOT. Uh, we're then going to transition to a panel of current and former CTED investigators uh, so that they can share their experiences with you about what it means to do technology transfer, how they integrated it into their projects. And then we're going to go to a panel of existing and potential stakeholders. That is a very critical part of the technology transfer process. So it'll be great to hear from them and get their perspective on working with CTED investigators. We'll wrap up with a discussion an open discussion between researchers and stakeholders, trying to spur on some, some topic-based discussions about what stakeholders are looking for, what researchers can, can provide. And then I wanted to throw this in here right after this workshop at 2.30, there's gonna be a presentation on intellectual property and it follows in with some of our topics that we're gonna be covering. So I wanted to make sure that was, that was noted. What is technology transfer? Why? Why do we want to do this? Well, there's a couple of reasons. Uh, CTED, as everyone knows, is a Department of Transportation funded center. And the DOT has incorporated technology transfer into the requirements and the metrics of CTED and other transportation centers across the country. So this has become an important part of what CTED is focusing on and integrating into proposals. So all of our proposals and the projects have a required T2 or technology transfer component now. So the purpose of this talk is trying to give uh, current investigators or prospective investigators an understanding of what does that mean? What do you have to start thinking about if that's something that really hasn't been on your radar in the past? What is technology transfer? The way, and uh, I have a reference here and there'll be more references at the end so that you can go and look at what the Department of Transportation is saying about technology transfer, what they want you to know about it and understand. Uh, and all of this information is coming from their sources uh, that we're really uh, focusing this on what the Department of Transportation is looking for, but it is relevant outside of uh, DOT. Uh, so you can find a lot of this information. There's a reference here at the bottom for some of that. So technology transfer, it's the process by which the transportation community in this case receives and applies the results of research. And the key here is that it's applied by the community. So examples of technology transfer in this context could mean the implementation of a policy recommendation by a municipality. So taking it further than we've developed a policy recommendation, but actually getting it implemented by an entity. Or the incorporation of new software or algorithms into an application that may be in use by a government or, or agency or company, uh, but it's actually looking at how are they applying the results of the work that you're doing or the research that you're doing. So the keys to successful technology transfer as defined by the Department of Transportation, couple of steps. First, create a technology transfer plan. And that's where we're gonna spend a few more slides going through what exactly is in a technology transfer plan. It's very important because that's actually what we ask our CTED investigators to include in their proposals. A big part of it is engaging stakeholders. So whether that means utilizing your own network of connections uh, other partner universities. Uh, I'll get into a little bit more about maybe some of the places where you can reach out to find stakeholders if, if you don't already, if you're not already connected to them. And then securing resources. You know what your plan is, you have your stakeholders, you need to get some resources. Maybe that's C10, maybe that's another federal or state agency, maybe it's directly from those stakeholders themselves. Some stakeholders may want to directly contract with you to do the work and then execute on the plan. You have your plan, you have your stakeholders, you have your resources, monitor the progress throughout. Technology transfer doesn't just happen at the beginning, it doesn't just happen at the end, it happens throughout the project. And a big part of this is understanding that some stakeholders may leave, you may need to find new ones to bring on, that's all normal, it happens, and you just need to work through that and utilize your network of connections to, to help you with that. 
So we want to dive into the technology transfer plan specifically, and this is what we are looking for in the proposals. Uh, as was mentioned earlier in the day, there is going to be an, another RFP released, I think, in the fall. Uh, so keep in mind that this is part of the review process. We look at the technology transfer plans. Uh, and I wanted to highlight in particular, there's a resource called Developing and Executing Your Technology Transfer Plan, a 10-point checklist. This is the link. And again, we'll make these uh, references and resources available uh, after the event and after the workshop so you can find them. This plan has four parts. It's broken down into a what, who, how, and how well. So the what is describing the problem and the proposed technology. The who identifying the stakeholders involved in the plan. How means developing your plan and executing on it and how well measuring, monitoring your performance, using metrics uh, and determining how you're doing and if you need to make adjustments. So starting with the what, describing the problem. First, what's the problem that you're trying to solve? What is it? Is there a functional need? Does somebody need a new hardware developed? Do they need a new program written? Do they need new processes? Do they need a new policy? Do they need to have new awareness? What is that problem that, that a, a stakeholder somebody is looking for, that they have a challenge with, that they need a solution for? Next is describing what is that solution. Very simple, you know, what do you want to do? You, you know that there's this problem out there. Well, what are you going to do to try to solve that? Think about things like, is it feasible? You may think it's a great idea, but is it actually going to be something that can, can work? Is it something that if it if you're able to finish your project, uh, is it something that's not too expensive? Is it going to be within the reach of the stakeholder to be able to implement it? And is it really going to add value? So maybe you can make a, a new widget or you can write a new program, but is that really going to add value to what the stakeholder is trying to do and trying to accomplish? Um, you could... In research, you know, we do a lot of fundamental research at universities, and that's great, new discoveries, new inventions. But in this particular case, when we're talking about technology transfer, it really has to be something useful to that end user in order for them to take it and apply it. Identifying the stakeholders. We've mentioned, I've already mentioned the stakeholder a lot. It's very important. You need to find what are those different groups that need that that you want to engage or you could engage for this particular project. Um, it says identify the stakeholder groups by name and role. This is thinking what kind what kind of stakeholders are needed. Do you need an R&D partner? Do you need somebody who can actually provide some sort of technical support or, or aspect to it? Do you need people who are going to be these early adopters who need who are going to take it on? Do you need trade organizations who are going to be the ones communicating it and getting it out into the, into society? So once you think about these different types of groups and you find different stakeholders that fit all these different types of groups, the next step is analyzing that the stakeholder alignment and their interest. Um, and this will help you determine how you engage with them because you could have stakeholders across a wide range of, of areas. So in particular, there's a little chart here and there's more information in some of the resources about how you can analyze the stakeholders. So there's, a line, there's um, alignment and interest. Do they align well with your technology or your, your solution or this area? Or do they not align very closely with it? And same with interest. Do they have really high interest in it or low interest? And you can think of somebody who has really high alignment. They're very tightly connected to what you're trying to do, but they're, they have low interest in what you are particularly trying to solve. And in that case, these may be types of stakeholders that you want to inform about the project. You need to get the word out raise their interest level. They're already aligned well. You just need to get them to know about what you're trying to do and uh, increase their, their level of interest. You could have people who are or stakeholders who they don't really align well and they don't have interest. You're not going to spend much time on them. You can, you can go ahead and put them to the bottom of the, of the list. Uh, you're going to spend your time looking at stakeholders elsewhere. There could be those who don't align particularly well with your particular solution but they are highly interested in this field. And in that case, they could be considered a threat to what you're trying to do. They may be somebody who wants to look at things from a different perspective. You're gonna to try to get them onto your team. You're gonna, these are people that if you interact with them, you have to think about how do I convince them that this is something that they should be, that they should listen to what we're trying to do and, and believe in the solution. But most importantly, there's gonna be the high alignment and high interest. And those are the stakeholders that you're going to engage you're going to engage with closely. They're going to be your allies in this. And most likely, those are the ones that you're going to partner with uh, on your CTED projects.
So once you understand where all these different stakeholders fall, you can come up with your plan on how you're going to communicate with them. And in particular, you need to understand and figure out what do I need from them and what do they need from me? Uh, am I going to be looking for data from them? Am I going to be looking for them to uh, pilot a technology? Am I going to be looking for them to help communicate this uh, to their audience? And then what do they want to hear from me? What kind of uh, designs do I need to put together? What kind of plan do I need to put together? What do I have to be prepared with when I go to them so I can convince them to work with me on this? Next is how, developing and executing the, the plan. You're gonna develop your engagement plans. You're gonna reach out to them, to these uh, potential adopters. Who are you gonna contact? Come find out their names. Do you email them? Do you call them? Can you go visit them when, when we're able to do more uh, interpersonal things? But, um, and make sure you have your information ready to go when you do contact them. Think through all of these steps. And then identify the resources in order to do that. That could be pretty simple. It could be, well, I know I have to travel uh, to this office where they're located. Maybe they're located in Austin and I'm up here in DFW. Um, maybe there's somebody who they host a meeting, but I need to get invited to that meeting. So what do I need to do in order to get that audience with them? Once you do talk to them, you need to understand what are going to be their barriers. So if you develop the solution, it, you think it fits their needs, that it meets their needs, well, what could possibly happen that would keep them from actually adopting it? Um, maybe it's the technology, maybe it's another technology in partner with yours. Maybe it's some regulatory burden that needs to be addressed through, through um, policy means or through uh, city councils. Uh, maybe it's a communication, maybe they need help with actually how, how do you get this message out. Uh, so thinking about those ahead of time will help you plan how to best conduct your technology transfer for your project. And another point here is the one of the final points is establish necessary agreements. This is something you should be thinking about all the way at the beginning. Uh, these are agreements that could be between you, your institution. So like for instance, here at UT Arlington could include the sponsors or the stakeholders. Um, with CTED, you'll have agreements with CTED, but you may also need to have additional agreements with, maybe you're working with uh, Texas Department of Transportation. You may need additional agreements with them. They could be uh, MOUs, they could be non-disclosure agreements. The best thing for this is to talk to some of the people at your university or with the CTED administration, and we can help you determine how to best start that process. But um, this will also lay the groundwork for future intellectual property discussions and planning. You really want to get all your, all your ducks in a row at the beginning so you're well prepared throughout the process and everyone is aware of what the, what the process is and the rules are. And then with how well your performance, the key thing here is metrics. What are we measuring? How, what are we going to report back to DOT? So these are the things that we need to evaluate the success, any future plans, any improvements. We will collect these quarterly for CTED projects and uh, during final reports. And then we report these back up. We report them to DOT. But it also helps us work with you, the investigator, to identify how, how are things been going? Have you been struggling with communicating with this particular stakeholder? Can we help you in finding a different stakeholder or figuring out how better to communicate with them? Are there other resources needed? So we're going to keep a close eye on those and be in contact throughout the project to, to make sure you're doing as well as you can when it comes to technology transfer. So some of the things may include for metrics, you see these in our RFPs, outputs, and that is first, and these could be things like you put up a website, you develop a podcast, uh, you might have a pilot program, you host workshops, you may give presentations, those are all your outputs. Very important to know, we wanna hear about those, we wanna document those. Then the outcomes, well, how many people actually went to the website? How many people uh, committed to, uh, after they learned about it, to wanting to adopt that technology? Um, really looking at what happens next once you put something out there, who took it in, how did they take it in? And then the final thing is impacts. And this is a big thing that we will measure at CTED. And this comes down to the heart of it is how effective your solution is uh, for, for the community. And this could be in terms of how much time, how much money, how many lives were saved, what was the impact to society? Uh, how can we measure that? Some of these things may happen after your project technically ends with CTED, but these are things that you should be looking at and we'll try to work with you on how do we, how do we monitor that more in a long term. So what do you do now? This was a really brief intro to what a technology transfer plan is. I realize it, 
we have resources for this, but it's to get you introduced to it and to get you start thinking about it. So at this point, stakeholders. It's the first thing when you're going to talk about technology transfer because you need to you need to have that entity that wants that needs a solution. They have a problem and they want you to help them solve that. So this could be, do you already have relationships with stakeholders? We heard from a few folks this morning with local transit organizations, uh, both in Dallas and Fort Worth in this North Texas community. There's others at all the other universities. You know, do you have connections with these individuals? Do you need connections with them? Can CTED help with that? Can the directors and assistant directors help you make those connections? Your university technology transfer offices, other colleagues, professional organizations, all could be places to help find these stakeholders. Next step would be have a discussion with them, talk with them. What are their needs? What are your ideas on how you can address their needs? We, again, this morning's panel was a great example where they talked about certain things that on how researchers in CTED could, could uh, help with them in communication and, and data. So listen to them. Their input, their feedback is very important. They need to believe that it's gonna meet their needs if they're gonna partner with you, if they're gonna support your, your work. Look for funding opportunities, maybe that's CTED, develop the proposal. And then as solutions are developed, engage your technology transfer offices so you can guide, be, so they can guide you on intellectual property um, and these other partnerships. There may not be any IP, there may be IP, there's a lot of other areas in there that could be, could be affected. But the, be, the best resource for that is your tech tra transfer offices. So that was a real quick primer. We wanted to get to the PI panel and have them talk about their experiences with technology transfer, but I wanted to make sure you understand that there's more information coming to you through this event. There's the intellectual property talk, real brief talk today at 2.30 right after this workshop. And then uh, there's a community partnerships uh, workshop uh, today at 2.45. And then there's a, another workshop tomorrow at one on developing relationships with stakeholders. So all of those will help give you more and more uh, resources and information to help you through the tech transfer process. A list of resources, these will be available for you. Um, we are at 1247, which we wanted to get to the PI uh, stakeholder, or um, the panel of CTED PIs. So I wanna go to that because we're gonna get their thoughts on this, their experience. They've actually done this, <laughs> sometimes multiple times. So I think it'll be really good to hear from them and then be able to have audience questions uh, through that process. So I think I'm gonna stop sharing my screen because we wanna be able to see our speakers, our panelists. Hi everyone. So Hello. I'm gonna go ahead and introduce each one of you uh, briefly, and then we're gonna have a chance to go around and have each one of you talk about your experiences. So thank you so much for joining us. Uh, Dr. Melanie Sattler, is the Saeed Kasem Endowed Professor of Civil Engineering at UT Arlington and serves as PI, has served as PI on two CTED projects, both involving developing a food flora waste to fleet fuel framework, which will help communities evaluate the economic feasibility of creating renewable fleet fuel using existing wastewater treatment plant digester infrastructure. Welcome, Dr. Sattler. Next is Dr. Andrea Hicks. Dr. Hicks is an assistant professor at the University of Wisconsin-Madison in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering and the Interim Director for Sustainability Education and Research. In her research, she utilizes tools such as life cycle assessment, techno-economic analysis, and agent-based modeling to explore the environmental impacts and sustainability implications of emerging technologies. Welcome. Dr. Franklin Boluga is a research engineer at the Georgia Institute of Technology. His work cuts across a broad range of transportation research from operations and safety of highways, transportation energy and emission modeling to operations of the multimodal freight transportation system. His recent work includes the CTED funded effort on environmental justice implications of roadway topography. Christine Williams, Ms. Williams is the program director of planning and corridor management research at the Center for Urban Transportation Research at the University of South Florida. Her research interests include thoroughfare planning, access management, multimodal planning, transportation equity, and sustainable transportation. Her recent work includes a CTED funded effort for a transportation equity toolkit for transportation planning. And finally is Dr. Anurag Pandey. Dr. Pandey is a professor of civil engineering at Cal Poly San Luis Obispo. His research interests include data mining applications and observational data analysis 
including in the areas of traffic safety and crashes, driver behavior, transportation resilience, and emergency evacuation. He has been involved in 10 different CTED research projects, six as PI and four as co-PI. So definitely an expert in what we do. But so I wanted to hand it over to uh, Dr. Sattler first. Uh, you have finished one CTED project. You're now furthering the research in a follow-on effort. So we'd love to hear about your experience when it comes to technology transfer in your projects. All right, thank you. So as you heard in the introduction, uh, our projects have involved developing a spreadsheet tool uh, for cities and regions to use uh, to look at feasibility of turning waste into fleet fuel. Uh, so specifically, we're looking at turning food and yard waste into fuel using existing digester infrastructure. So in the first year of the project, we looked at digester infrastructure at wastewater treatment plants. Uh, so the digesters are already built, but in a lot of cases, they have excess capacity. And so you could add food and yard waste to them and generate more biogas. So the digesters generate this biogas, uh, which can be upgraded and used as renewable natural gas for vehicles. Uh, it can also be used to generate electricity if you have electric vehicles. And so our goal was to develop a spreadsheet tool that cities and regions could use to look at whether this kind of thing would be feasible. Uh, whether it would be economically feasible um, at a high level. So we, we have a screening tool. Um, and if our screening tool shows that it's feasible, then they could dive into the details and develop a more detailed plan to, to actually get the things done. Um, so when we started the first year of the project, we were at um, technology level two, technology readiness level two. Uh, so that meant we had the application formulated um, but we were trying to go to technology readiness level six, uh, which is demonstrated in a relevant environment. So um, in terms of technology transfer, uh, we didn't have a final product yet that we were trying to get people to use. Uh, so we uh, brought on stakeholders that were early potential adopters to get their help in actually formulating the spreadsheet. Uh, so our stakeholders, the first year of the project were North Central Texas Council of Governments and also the city of Dallas. Uh, so we had a couple of formal meetings with them, but then we also had a lot of emails, phone calls, uh, informal interactions, and they were really, really helpful in helping us uh, get the spreadsheet tool formulated. So uh, we would ask them, you know, if we're thinking of having this as an input, is this the kind of data that you would have readily available or um, would that not be something that you could use as an input very readily? Uh, we asked them about outputs that we were thinking, you know, what would be most useful to them. Um, sometimes they provided sources of data uh, that, that we weren't aware of. And we got um, a first iteration of the spreadsheet developed, and then we used it um, to do a case study for City of Dallas. So then Dallas uh, supplied us with specific input information to use. Um, during the first year of the project, we also reached out to several cities and states around the country that were collecting food waste already. Uh, in most cases, they were not digesting it. Uh, they may have been composting it, but they were doing the collection, and we wanted to find some information about what was working and what wasn't. And from that, uh, when we started the second year of the project, we formed an advisory group. And we have as a part of the advisory group, the North Central Texas Council of Governments, once again. Uh, we also brought on a city and state that we connected with during the first year. So we brought on state of Vermont and city of Las Vegas. And one of the things I should have mentioned, uh, our project involves um, different kinds of stakeholders. So uh, transportation stakeholders, because they would be involved in the fleets that would be using the fuel. Uh, but we also have environmental stakeholders that would be involved in waste 
and also the wastewater. So from North Central Texas Council of Governments, we had representatives from Environmental Department and the Transportation Department. Uh, same thing with City of Dallas, and then same thing with Las Vegas and Vermont. Um, we also added agricultural stakeholders in the second year of the project because we were wanting to integrate farm digesters uh, that were already existing as well. Um, in the advisory group for the second year, we also brought in a for-profit stakeholder, Waste Management Inc. So they're one of the two large firms that does waste collection across the U.S. Uh, we brought in a nonprofit, which is the Natural Gas Vehicle Alliance. And then we brought in a couple of consultants that build digesters. And um, again, they have been just invaluable uh, resources as we make modifications and further develop the tool. Um, we're hoping that the advisory group that we have for the uh, second year will help us encourage other early potential adopters of the tool uh, when we get the second iteration of it finished at the end of the second year. So I'll hand it off to the next panelist. Great, thank you so much. That's uh, very interesting to hear about. I'm sure we'll uh, be able to have some good questions for your work uh, in a little bit. Uh, going to uh, Dr. Hicks, um, in your current CTED project, you're working with an electric bike share company. So it'd be very interesting to hear your take on how you developed that relationship, how you're working with them and your experience. Great, and first I just wanted to thank you for the invitation to be here today. Um, yes, so uh, I've been PI on two projects for CTED, one around autonomous vehicles. So thinking about autonomous vehicle ride sharing and environmental implications due to mode shifting. And now we're working with an e-bike share company, which is really exciting. Um, and actually, so it's interesting, we have e-bike shares around Madison, and these are pedal assisted e-bikes. So you have to pedal and they have a battery. And I was looking at them as they're all around campus. I was like, wow, these would be really interesting to study. Um, I have a bad habit of that. I'm like, oh, this technology is really interesting. We should probably look at it. But I broadly work on emerging technologies and environmental implications, so it's okay. And so I started asking around my university, you know, how, how do I talk to these people? Do we know someone? Um, we've got a pretty significant transportation group here um, and they're wonderful to work with. And I eventually got contact information for someone at B-Cycle. And we were actually one of the first um, cities where they were trying the electric assist bikes. So in their other cities, the program, they have um, programs in several cities, but most of them are actually non-pedal, like just normal conventional bicycles. So the idea that, you know, you pick it up for a short ride. And so it's been a really exciting opportunity. Um, so we've been working with them to look at the environmental impacts of mode shifting once somebody has an e-bike membership. So e-bikes are actually really expensive. They're usually over a thousand dollars and the memberships are much more affordable to their program at about $120 a year. And to put that in comparison, their um, memberships are about $20 a month, whereas a monthly bus pass here is about $65 a month. So it's actually cheaper which is interesting. I mean, a single ride is $5 and a single ride on the bus is $2. So there's an interesting, like if you use it enough, it's actually cost comparative. And there's a question too about when our bus routes don't run at certain times of night, but you could still access the e-bicycles from the kiosks. So our big question is, well, what are the environmental impacts? What trips are people making? Was our big question. And actually B-Cycle's big question. They would like to know where people are going and how they used to make these trips to understand you know, what is the difference in environmental impact when we think about the carbon intensity of your mode choice. And so that's been really fun and they've been very excited about the research thinking about you know, how can they reduce their carbon footprint and how can they reduce the carbon footprint of the city of Madison by looking at our transportation. You know, there've been some challenges throughout it. Um, you, know, you talked a little bit about redundancy earlier, which I appreciated. And you know, one of our contacts left very suddenly and actually we didn't realize they left the company. So it took a little bit of maneuvering because no one actually knew about our project. 
Um, but once we got reconnected, it's been great. And they have a lot of enthusiasm and they're really excited. So they've just been really wonderful to work with. And with that, I'll, we can head to the next person. Well, thank you. Very positive experiences so far. That's great. Uh, Dr. Uh, Beloga, your recent CTIP project involved a few different stakeholders. Can you also talk about your experience? Yes. <clears throat> thank you for inviting me. And um, so we looked at environmental justice implications for roadway uh, topography. And the reason why we looked at it is because currently when cities and organizations are trying to do environmental justice analysis, they would use a 250 meter buffer along the road <clears throat> to determine who is being affected. But the analysis does not involve roadway topography. But research has shown that topography plays a very big impact in emissions. And nobody had been able to do it because it's, it's a tedious process trying to append roadway topography to your analysis in moves. But at Georgia Tech, we developed a streamlined process to do that. And so we wanted to show that if you, if you take it, you'll be able to apply it to your moves analysis and improve the estimates you are making because it really affects who or which group of people along the road we are going to consider to be uh, affected. So uh, when we started, I didn't know uh, most of my stakeholders. I spoke with one of my senior colleagues here who said I should contact somebody at ARC, Atlanta Regional Commission, which I did. And then I, I did a seven slide presentation to him, mainly on the project objectives and showed him a preliminary result, something we could get from joining all these models together. And he was really interested because in 2000, they had done a study where they recommended that topography should be looked at more in Atlanta, but since then it hadn't been done. So he got on board and then he also recommended somebody at the Georgia Environmental Protection Division which I also went there and made a presentation to him. And he also got on board with the, the project. So they were very instrumental in trying to help us. Um, the ARC guy also connected us to <clears throat> the model user group in Atlanta, which we didn't even know existed. So these are companies and professionals who all build transportation models I never heard of them, but he gave us opportunity to go and present our findings to them at their quarterly meeting. And the guy at Georgia Environmental Protection Division, he also took the report and distributed it internally within their offices. And everybody went through it and gave us comments. And we had like a, an over one hour phone conference just talking about the findings and what they also think so it's really improved the final product that we, we had uh, in terms of adoption uh, i don't think it's ready to be adopted yet mainly because the, the software that mpus use travel demand model is built by third parties who were not our stakeholders now, whether they would want to go the extra step of adopting our process and appending the topography to their, their models is the next step. And we have to find a way to, to reach out to them. So I think one of the questions Eileen asked me was, if I had to do something different, what would I do? I think in choosing the stakeholders for such a project, we should probably have gotten somebody who builds a travel demand model to be a stakeholder because eventually they are the one that can get it operationalized because mpos i don't think they are going to build their own vision models like we did just to steady the work but because travel demand models are already there those guys will really be helpful in appending roadway topography to 
to the awake. And um, uh, she also asked me, what was technology transfer like before my project? Honestly, all the work I've done before, it was just sponsored by somebody and I just gave them the report. But this seated project was different because here I had to reach out to stakeholders who were not necessarily my sponsors and get them interested in what I was doing, which was a new experience and make presentations to them. Previously, I just get my work done and I give it to GDOT or whoever sponsored my work. So that was a bit different. And I think it was very important to be able to do something like that. And also what worked for me uh, to communicate with my stakeholders. Now, this is all just retroactive, uh, re retrospective. So I think <clears throat> most stakeholders are busy, at least the ones that I worked with. Uh, too much communication will be a burden, too less will not be effective. So uh, looking at what I did, what would really work was in your first interaction with them, to get them on board, really make a pitch to them why they would really be interested in what you are doing. Then after that, just regular updates on key milestones, where we are on the project. Can we have a meeting to talk about this uh, stage of the project? And then also, I think it's for, for our type of work, it was probably better to, it's good to reach out to them, not really at the early stage, like, um, the first speaker uh, talked about. But when you have all your models kind of set up and you are really ready to do analysis, then you can bring them in because at that stage, any suggestions they make, you can quickly test it and get back to them. But if I reach out to them at the beginning, it may take like three, four months before I can even implement what they are telling me and their interest may go down. So. In my kind of work, just waiting a little bit before I reach out to them will really get them engaged because I can get in touch with them on a maybe bi-weekly basis, putting all their suggestions together and giving them feedback and stuff. So yeah, that was my experience. Uh, if there are more specific questions, I'll be able to explain. That's fantastic. It's great to hear about those types of challenges and adjustments and kind of lessons learned. So I'm sure we'll be able to get into a little bit more of that as well. Thank you. Uh, so we'll go over to Ms. Williams. So uh, you've also been a CTED PI on multiple projects, and you're with the Center for Urban Transportation Research, which has a focus on technology transfer, as I may understand. So your perspective is, is really interesting. I'd love to hear more about what you have to say. Uh, yeah, thanks very much, Eileen. Appreciate it. Um, and and definitely, uh, I think my entire career has been focused on technology transfer. And many years ago, I said to myself, I'm not going to do any more research until I start seeing this research implemented. And so it's, it's really a commitment that I have um, in my work. Uh, so uh, as you mentioned, you know, we've conducted a series of research projects relative to integrating equity and in regional transportation planning. And the idea actually for this research uh, emerged through some of my early conversations with a key stakeholder, our regional planning agency. Um, and what I tend to do is uh, when an RFP comes out related to research, share that with various stakeholders and talk to them about it. Uh, I think one of the that's one of the most effective ways it, it really to uh, if you want your research to be relevant to the needs of stakeholders is to ask them what their needs are and how you might shape uh, a research project that would relate to that. And and one of their key interests at that time was in improving planning practices relative to social equity. So that set us on a, a path of uh, accomplishing that goal. And we did look all over the country. We, I think, interviewed um, uh, numerous uh, uh, MPOs. We looked at 37 different MPO long range plans. 
Um, I think we had about 16 interviews with MPOs. And so we really wanted to get a sense of what's the state of the practice out there now and found that it really varied in terms of scope and effectiveness. And so with funding from, from CTED, we were able to then take that to the next level and develop a couple of tools uh, and a toolkit uh, offering guidance on some effective practices and, and, and particularly in identifying needs of underserved communities and also screening and, and selecting projects. Um, the whole toolkit is designed to be accessible uh, to a broad group of stakeholders, both technical staff and community organizers and, and community members could even use that um, toolkit uh, at in varying degrees. So we have some some very highly technical guidance associated with it, but also some some easy to use guidance. And, and so that again, that was our focus. Um, so I'd say we, you know, our, during this, our technology readiness level, uh, and we, we use a little mind magic to apply that to, to policy work like this, um, we're in mid to late stage, uh, certainly, and uh, uh, I think uh, our hope is that uh, uh, it'll be uh, TRL 8, if, if not 9, ultimately, when, when, when the uh, work is adopted. Um, so the so in terms of that, of course, we want we wanted to make sure our work was well well grounded in practice. So we reached out again to the executive director of our area MPO. Um, we involved them and City of Tampa staff who who agreed to collaborate on developing the tool and testing and some in kind staff time uh, as well to serve as as match. Uh, so in terms of what that looked like, um, periodic meetings with the MPO and staff at key points in the research and tool development, uh, starting with early on, uh, as one of our, our presenters mentioned, uh, is important with the kickoff and, and even actually in shaping the research. So uh, we wanted to obtain their guidance, but also saw that as a two-way street, kind of a staff knowledge and capacity building activity so they could learn what we were learning along the way and and what we had learned from others and i think that is a motivation of staff to be involved in research actually to find out what's the latest uh going on so they uh they did collaborate on developing and beta testing the tools uh to identify uh, refinements and uh provided projects for for screening that we could use uh, and we reacted to those those findings and results. And later we we added another stakeholder, the university area CDC, which is a, a nonprofit organization that serves at risk communities uh, in uh, surrounding our campus. Um, because as part of this whole area, the, the, the MPO, and this is again led to a ongoing research had said, well, yeah, we need to screen and prioritize projects, but we also want more guidance and needs assessment. And so we saw that need uh, and, and put that all together in the toolkit. So it was a very positive experience. They were very accessible and interested. Um, staff from the different functional areas of the organization participated so that gave us and, and different levels of seniority as well and that gave us some really valuable guidance i think um, and i mentioned they provided projects uh, uh, they identified different refinements um, uh, ranging from the data sources you know where if this data was even available where was it available and methods um, to, to issues associated with transparency and political challenges that we wouldn't have been a, even aware of. So um, it really did help us and help us shape uh, our, our entire research. And as the projects neared completion, we were also brought in and asked to present the work to numerous committees. MPOs have different stakeholder committees, um, and ours had livable roadways, the technical committee, of course, made up of the different technical staff, um, the transportation disadvantage board, um, even the MPO board uh, on an earlier project to kind of get them 
uh, up to speed and I think also help the agency to ultimately implement the, the findings to, to kind of smooth the way to hear from the university was helpful to them. Uh, they were online and recorded and accessible to the public. So um, uh, that was another uh, benefit of that. And, and um, uh, I think that could lead to broader support. And then uh, we've conducted a series of, of presentations and webinars since then um, and published a, a paper uh, in, for the Transportation Planning Division of APA, uh, which puts out a state of transportation planning publication every year. So, um, and our Florida MPOAC, Florida is unique. It serves 27 different MPOs. So we have an overarching advisory council for MPOs, who's another stakeholder in this, and they're helping us disseminate our work um, so that the other MPOs in the area are, are, are up to speed. And we're starting to get requests for one-on-one, -on -one, hey, we're doing this, can you give us some more ideas? So I think the, that technology transfer is happening and will continue to happen. Well, thank you so much. It's, it's so interesting to hear just about all the back and forth that you can have with your stakeholders. And we've heard that from a, from a few people. So uh, great experience. Thank you for sharing that. Oh, Dr. Pandey, uh, you've also been involved, as we heard, many CTED projects. You're also one of the associate directors for CTED in general. So uh, please tell us about how you work with the local entities in uh, the, the uh, California region or elsewhere. Yeah. Thank, for sure. Thank you, Eileen, for inviting uh, inviting all of us and inviting me to be here. It's just a pleasure. And so one thing that I've been very fortunate about, one thing that has been very fortunate for me is that early in my career at Cal Poly, I got introduced to service learning and community engagement. And this was like four to five years into my career at Cal Poly. And I also, because of that, engagement that I have with our program, I ended up being the faculty liaison for the community engagement and service learning program here at Cal Poly. So because of that involvement, I learned early on that, you know, when we engage with the community, the best way to engage the community is not thinking of it as, you know, you're doing a favor to the stakeholder or you're helping out somebody, or maybe you're doing that, maybe you're providing that support and help, but thinking of that as a mutually beneficial partnership, as Christine mentioned, a two-way street is really the way to go. So what we should be thinking about is that the community engagement and um, broader technology transfer is really a two-way street. And I think if we approach it that way, then you know maybe we can build more beneficial partnership. And because I had some experience with that, I think that has helped us throughout these all these different CTED projects. Uh, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna just focus on one CTED, particular CTED project that we had very, very good engagement opportunities with Caltrans as well as our San Luis Obispo Council of Government. And you know, we've been very fortunate that we had really good stakeholders. Our Caltrans stakeholders, you know, he's involved with the CTED advisory board, Mr. John Liu. So I wanna recognize him. And then Mr. John Dinanzio, who you would hear from later in this panel as well. He is um, the program director for San Luis Obispo Council of Government, our local MPO. And he could probably tell you more about how successful the partnership was from his perspective. But, but I think from our perspective, it was a very uh, successful partnership that I wanna talk about. So, so this partnership sort of started with a really unfortunate event, really. We had a collision, uh, a bicycle, uh, not bicyclist, but uh, a motorcyclist collision on one of the intersections on a local expressway. Expressways are like really high speed, sort of rural environment facilities. Um, they're somewhere they're divided, some places they're not divided, and they have some at grade crossings, but the speed limits on those roadways are still 65 to 70 miles an hour. Um, and on wherever they're not, like they're, they have those at grade intersections speed limit was lower uh, to 65 miles an hour, but still pretty high. And, the, and that, that motorcyclist happened to be a Cal Poly student and he was riding down on the expressway and somebody who was making a left turn from that express, uh, on, on a, on, from a minor street onto that expressway had a collision. 
and, and because of that collision, the student lost his life. And it was just a tragic event. And everybody was sort of in the community was looking for answers. And, and we have certain intersections like that in our community. So what Caltrans ended up doing on that expressway was just basically closed that intersection for the left turn completely. And, and that solution you know, is, is, is okay from a safety perspective. However, there were you know, subsequent lawsuit on that location where there was a winery who filed a lawsuit saying that, you know, ultimately they took back the lawsuit, but the lawsuit contended that, you know, you're harming the business by closing the outlet left turn. And, and that was a, a potential challenge. And because, you know, as researchers, we are involved in, and by the way, I had to say, this was a collaborative project between Cal Poly and University of South Florida. So, so we had uh, folks from USF involved, Dr. Islam, Dr. Bertini, when he was here, he was involved as well. Um, so, it, because you know, we wanted to see you know the different impacts, and Florida has some more experience with that, with that type of intersection design, and that we wanted to implement. So, the community was looking for answers, and because we were familiar with some of these designs that that are called restricted crossing U-turns, so instead of closing down the intersection completely for the left turns, you make everybody make a right turn and then make a U-turn uh, some, some distance downstream. So, but the thing is that, you know, that those designs have been implemented in other states, in Missouri, um, somewhere in the middle, Michigan, uh, I believe also some in Florida, but not, not a whole lot. Um, but Caltrans has not implemented it ever. And, and I love, you know, folks at Caltrans, we, we closely work with them. And, but Caltrans as an agency, even though you would think if you're outside of California, you think of California as this sort of progressive, very progressive state. But if you look at Caltrans, and no offense to Caltrans, I love the people I work with. I know we have been on the recorded line here. So I love Caltrans. I love working with people. They fund a lot of our research. So thank you, thank you, thank you. But, but as, a, as a culture, I think Caltrans could be somewhat conservative. They don't implement new designs uh, at some of the, and, and part of that, part of the reason is that they're very big, they're a huge agency and, and getting folks on board could be difficult. But so, so we don't have any ARCA designs implemented anywhere in California. And so, so this was the project that we thought like not at that location, obviously, but, but uh, because this was already involved in some legal challenges, but, but in collaboration with, with San Luis Obispo Council of Government, we proposed them that one of the ideas could be on certain locations, different locations, but that have similar geometry is that instead of closing down the inter intersection completely for left turn, or you know, looking for that very expensive grade separated interchange design, why don't we look at something in between? That design could be the restricted crossing U-turn. So we proposed this project to CTED, San Luis Obispo Council of Government uh, uh, representatives also liked that idea. So they had some matching funds uh, involved in the project as well. And we, we said we were gonna select some locations for Caltrans, District 5, District 6. So District 5 is where San Luis Obispo is located. District 6 is, uh, a little bit further inland in the Central Valley area. And we picked out some locations and then we analyzed them that how well those locations might work. And with the help of uh, San Luis Obispo Council for Government, our stakeholders, we had the opportunity to present this work to local stakeholders and also the board of the San Luis Obispo Council of Government when we were able to complete the research. And what we found was that obviously this type of design won't work everywhere. But through our research, we were able to identify at least one location in District 5 and one location in Caltrans District 6 where this design may be actually feasible. And, and we are hoping that this is something that would get explored. To make sure that this does get explored, what we have done is we have used the framework, and I had my grad student do this, is that as part of the project, implement so Caltrans has, you know, whenever they want to implement any improvement at an intersection, they have a process called ICE, Intersection Control Evaluation. And I know a lot of other DOTs use this as well. This is sort of the federal highway 
has been pushing this approach on to different agencies and, and Caltrans has fully adopted it. And that really gives a fair shake to all different types of design. So what I had, what I had my grad student do, and I want to, you know, I want to acknowledge that they did it. Um, the, I, I didn't do much on, on that piece of it, is that they took the results of our research and for all intersections where we thought that this ARCA design might be feasible, we took the spreadsheet that Caltrans has for intersection control evaluation, and we took that format and created an ICE format evaluation for the ARCA design. Because our goal is to provide those spreadsheets to the actual engineers who do this stuff so that anytime they see a location where this could potentially be feasible, they can, con they can conduct that analysis and figure out whether or not something that this is, this is a intersection design that they want to explore or not. Because obviously our goal is not to push our cut design everywhere. Our goal is to see if this can be added as an option to evaluate by the engineers. And I think we are well on our way to do that. And so that basically puts our project from being a TRL technology readiness level being four or five at the beginning of the project to eight now for Caltrans. So, so that's, that's where the project is uh, right now where we have, we have basically made our ICE uh, evaluation worksheet available to, to Caltrans engineers uh, and, and, and then go from there. Now, one thing I wanna say is that, you know, one thing that I wouldn't do well, one thing I would do differently, you know, and, and this was, I, I feel so, you know, it was such a sort of a novice mistake that I shouldn't have made, but, but, you know, when we were reaching out at the time, when we had just initiated this project, in my initial email to our District 5 engineers and all our stakeholders, I specifically mentioned the intersection location that was involved in that lawsuit. And because of that mention, our District 5 engineers, even though they were supportive over all of the effort, they could not fully openly communicate with us. And it was such a mistake because we were not as specifically looking at that location at all. We were looking at three different locations and that, were, that have no crash history of this kind or you know, as of yet, fortunately. And these locations were, were completely different, very far away from that uh, lawsuit location. But by mentioning that, I sort of, you know, created a situation where engineers, our local district engineers couldn't cooperate with us as much. So we had to sort of go out to the field, collect some of our own data that could, could have potentially been provided by our local engineers. But I think they still were very supportive of the effort overall, even though they couldn't openly communicate with us. But obviously we had support, great support from San Luis Obispo Council of Government, Slocog, John Denunzio and his team and also from, from Caltrans District 6 engineers that were in fact able to provide. So overall, it didn't impact the success, but we did have to make some, some efforts. So we have to be sort of careful about, you know, what stakeholders might, you know, might be experiencing or what kind of pressures they might be under. So, so those kind of things have to be considered. So just to kind of, like, what are the lessons learned here for PIs who might be looking at future uh, opportunities? I would say definitely, connect with your community engaged learning or community based learning folks service learning folks on your campus i'm sure there is a service learning office out there so if you haven't connected with them maybe look at what transportation problems in the community you can solve as part of your classroom projects and these those can give you good perspective on how to engage broadly with other community partners build partnership so this is not the first time we have been talk we have been talked to john right so we had those established those connections before so when the RFP came along and when the community had a problem, we could approach with a solution to the community members. I think make those connections and uh, you know, beforehand. And then last thing is that, you know, go in with the attitude that this is a two-way partnership. It's not that you are doing the agencies a favor or anything like that. You have to go in with the attitude that this is gonna, you're gonna learn a lot along the way. Your students are gonna learn a lot along the way. So I think if we go in with that attitude, I think the partnerships could be successful. And hopefully you'll stick around to hear from our community partner, uh, Mr. John Denunzio, who will be speaking a little bit later in the panel. So I hope I didn't take too much of uh, the time in the panel, but I really appreciate this opportunity to share our experience here. No, thank you so much. I, you, you all gave such great examples and stories of how you have engaged with technology transfer. I think it gives uh, all the prospective PIs out there a good idea of, it's different, it's different for everyone. 
Uh, but it's very important, like you just talked about, uh, Dr. Pandey is listening up front, developing that relationship. A couple of you have lots of stakeholder partners, you know, that that may present its own challenges versus folks who have just one or two stakeholders where they can really focus on that. And so everyone's going to be different and, and everyone's technology is kind of at a different stage, but it's still, you can still engage in technology transfer. There's still a path uh, for you to do that. Um, I wanted to see, is there, are there any questions from the audience, James? I don't think I had seen any just yet. Yeah, I don't see any. Okay. At the moment. Um, I, I, we have our stakeholder panel that's actually supposed to start now, but I would ask all of you to stick around because after the stakeholder panel, so now all of them are going to talk about what it's like working with you. <laughs> uh, but, uh -oh. but, <laughs> uh, but then after that, we're hoping to bring everyone together. And the idea is to have that discussion about about how you do bring those those two teams uh, together and we'll be able to answer more questions or ask some questions at that time. So for about the next 30 minutes or so, we're gonna turn things over, but thank you to each one of you for participating in this panel and sharing your stories about your research and how you've started in on it and how you've been able to nurture that relationship or the challenges you've seen along the way. Truly appreciate it, thank you. So now thank we're- Thank you. So now we're going to switch over to James. Uh, and I know James uh, is probably known to each and every one of you, but uh, he's going to be the moderator for our next uh, panel, which is for the stakeholders. So I wanted to at least give a quick little intro to James, and then he can take it from, from there. So Jane, Dr. Wood is, serves as the program manager of CTED, overseeing much of the center's day-to-day -day operations, I mean, just everything. Uh, before transitioning to administration, though, Dr. Wood led research projects at CTED, exploring bike share, electric scooters, and transit planning for Texas suburbs, much, much more. Uh, but at least that's a that's a quick introduction into the types of things that research that that James has been involved in. So, James, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Eileen. Uh, yeah, that's something that I, I used to remind people about more. But you know, I, I'm an administrator now, but I used to do research at CTED and at another UTC before. So, and I've also worked in the public sector. So I've, I've had stints all over the map on these issues. Um, so for this, I, I think the, as Eileen said, the purpose of sort of this half of the, the panel is to talk to the community uh, stakeholders, the people who work in the transportation sector. All three of our panelists are uh, public sector employees. So that's where a lot of our research traditionally ends up is with state DOTs, MPOs, local governments. And um, I think they're, they're the dominant voice in sort of implementing what you research after the fact. But also we're, we're looking for ways to, to, to build richer relationships between academia and the, the public sector at the start of a research project. As Eileen said, it's, it's one thing to do a study on a university campus and then hand it off and just say, I wrote this guidebook, please do something with it, good luck. But to sit down with a stakeholder before you do your study and before it gets funding and say, what problems can I help you with? You know, my, my students are really good with new software programs or we have access to all sorts of data how can we help you serve the public how can we help you solve problems so with that in mind i wanted to ask each of the three new panelists that we have here um, first to introduce themselves but also to, to make it a little more interesting to say to describe one problem or, or challenge that they've observed in their workplace that maybe a university could help them with. And um, can I start in reverse distance farthest away from, from my university would be Mr. Denunzio. Welcome. Hi, uh, uh, good afternoon uh, for those of you in that time zone. I'm uh, John Denunzio. Um, with uh, the San Luis Obispo Council of Governments. Uh, we're right in between San Francisco and LA uh, on uh, 
almost on the coast. Uh, I'm in uh, programming and project delivery uh, for our um, our MPO here. Um, and to to answer or answer your your, your question, what what challenge or could could um, uh, could see Ted or um, academics help us more with uh, I, I think I think the the com you know the community engagement um, that s stage of the project would be um, would be kind of one one area um, but also um, you know in, in preparation uh, for that uh, some some of the the, the the data visualizations that that we use when we're trying to uh, sell, a particular project, um, you know, a grand design like an interchange or um, you know dual roundabouts uh, or something. Uh, the, the modeling that can be used um, that is is done uh, at universities is something that we pay uh, often a considerable amount of money for, um, and it still might not have that um, sort of persuadable or factor that the public can uh, can really relate to. So it might it might help the engineers out and we might be able to cost it with uh, with that, but but really um, showing uh, what a vision for uh, for the future for a particular project might be is um, geez, uh, it'd be, send us uh, send us an army of people who can do that. It'd be great. Uh, Mr. Duvall from the Florida Department of Transportation. You're muted. Uh, Sorry about that. Um, um, as James said, I uh, am with Florida Department of Transportation. I specialize actually in bridges and the analysis of uh, bridges and, and policy. Um, uh, as, as, as far as um, things that projects could help us do before the meeting started, I listed out 10 projects that off the top of my head and on the continuum of, of not so good to the, the best, the best ones all had really active engagement. Um, probably the best one was our carbon uh, fiber reinforced plastic research with the structures lab. And that is a, it's a continuous feedback loop where they'll maybe write a paper on it, then go out and build something and work with the manufacturers um, and then go back to the lab and do some more testing. Um, and, and at least from, in, in my office, that's what, what is most appealing. Um, this is something that's, um, that's active. Thanks. And Dr. Ann Foss. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Ann Foss. I'm the principal planner um, in the Office of Strategic Initiatives for the city of Arlington uh, here in Texas. So um, I traditionally am a long range planner. We maintain the city's comprehensive plan and another of, a, a number of other long range plans. We also do transportation planning for the city. Um, and because of that, we have sort of worked ourselves into um, leading a lot of uh, transportation innovation projects for the city of Arlington. Um, for those of you who don't know, the city of Arlington has the uh, dubious distinction of being the largest city in the United States without any form of public transportation for a very long time. Um, we have not been able to get citizen support to join one of the local transit authorities here in DFW. Um, and so we have been piloting other ways of getting around that. Um, so we launched a on-demand rideshare service in partnership with VIA that's been operating for about three and a half years in Arlington. Uh, at the beginning of this year, we expanded to have that service cover the entire city limit. So that is serving as our form of public transportation right now. We've also done um, three pilots now with autonomous vehicles in Arlington. So I work in that, that space of some um, kind of non-traditional or, or more innovative uh, transportation projects. And one of the things that, um, you know, would be helpful for us, again, um, we haven't had public transportation in the past. Now that we do, um, 
that kind of user um, user feedback, writer experience type of information and better understanding how we can get people to make the switch from a personal vehicle to using um, our public transportation options or biking or walking, um, you know, really digging into that detail of understanding, um, you know, what people need, uh, how they get around, that type of information is oftentimes time consuming to collect. Um, and that is, is something that we often don't have the resources to be able to do at the municipal level. So that's that's one example, definitely echoing um, what Andrew and John have said about community engagement. Um, that is that is an important piece and definitely something that we also look for um, and could use help with from time to time as well. So one of the things that um, I, I was hoping one of our earlier panels would get to and they weren't able to, the issue didn't come up, but it, it comes up to me all the time. I, I'm the program manager and I see research projects come through my office as they're, they're finished. So um, I, I get to see it sort of put on the bookshelf, so to speak. And um, a lot of data uh, is, or I guess are created and, and gathered from research projects or transit agencies, roadway studies, but then, there's still this question, at least in my own mind, of how does it get implemented? How does it get used? And we're in this era of big data now where every device, every vehicle collects copious amounts of data on its operations and its performance and maintenance. But then I guess my question is, as, as public agencies, you, you have a very broad, very large mission not always the resources to, to touch on everything equally. So sort of what do you do with all this data that researchers collect and, and hand over, you know, maybe a, a database or an Excel file of maybe they've done a survey of, of every bridge in your state and they hand that to you. Um, is, is that inherently less useful or are there things they could be doing to make these large data chunks more accessible, um, maybe publish them in a more accessible format so that practitioners can make use of it so that it doesn't just sit on a bookshelf. Sorry, that's a long question. We, we have the same problems ourselves. Uh, we generate these voluminous bridge inspection reports and we give them to the bridge owners and we fear that they're filed away and accepted, but not acted upon because they're, they're, they just need a summary to say what to do. So we've proposed to, to summarize it. As far as more to your question, um, uh, one of the things that a researcher who looked at culverts, for instance, in, in my field um, could do, they, they came up with a, a stack of recommendations and it's sort of fancy ways to analyze these old box culverts to get them to pass. Um, and and that's, that's good, but what they really could have done to help us nationally was to, in addition to the theory, give us a couple of, of solid real world examples, uh, putting those things into action. And, and really that, that would not have been a big stretch for them to do. And I think it would have really informed their, their paper a, a lot. Um, how about? Um, yeah, I mean, to be completely blunt, uh, at least my experience with the city of Arlington is we don't want all the raw data. We, we don't we don't want to sift through all of it. And honestly, that's one of the things that we're looking for when we partner with, with other organizations or with universities is, is we're relying on our partners to do a lot of that analysis for us. So um, what we're really looking for is, um, you know, what what's the bottom line? What are the key findings? Um, what are the policy implications of the data? Um, and if it can be summarized in a couple of pages in layperson terms, with some really nice graphics that can convey that information, that's going to be a lot more useful to us um, 
than massive Excel spreadsheets with raw data because we just typically don't have the capacity um, to sift through all of that. And, and you know, the city generates a ton of data too that we're already managing. Um, and th this question actually came up, I was uh, attending a conference the last couple of days that was put together by the Federal Highway Administration and a um, AMPO, the um, group of MPOs for across the nation. Um, and I don't think everybody on that call agreed with me, but there were definitely others who echoed that sentiment of, there's too much data. We don't want it all. We want the we want the findings. We want the answers, not the raw data. Um, yeah, I, I have two two thoughts uh, on on this, and the first is um, you know it really is a pretty exciting time in information graphics and uh, geographical information systems and data warehousing. I mean, geez, to be a data scientist now. Uh, um, in this day and age, and, and whatever, whether it's transportation or health, um, it's. Um, but but on the on the other hand, um, you know, a lot of the data that we see with traffic counts around intersections or determining um, you know, development impact fees or costs, um, and then with uh, CEQA regulations, the California um, Environmental Quality Act, um, and NEPA, the the, the data get the traffic count data, for instance, gets old, right? So, you know, four years, uh, you know, four years go by and, you know, new developments gone up and the traffic patterns have changed. And so um, it's hard, you know, it's hard to see old documents get thrown away, you know, uh, and think, oh, well, it's archived, it's saved here, you know, somebody will sift through it, it will digitize it. But, um, but really just kind of echoing what Anne said, um, the uh, the the need for policymakers to have an executive summary of decision making um, so that agreements can be made uh, is is really where our focus uh, our focus is. Yeah, one of the uh, deliverables that all CTED projects have to produce is a policy brief, which is usually about two pages, and um, ideally it, it's it's basically it's like a memo, a technical memo that it, it summarizes the project in specific areas and they have to fill in policy recommendations and you know, areas of, of dispute or conflict. They can try to predict those ahead of time. And then ideally they would hand it over to their community stakeholders as a, a wrapped up project that's just one or two pages. It takes a few minutes to skim. Um, but a lot of times the, the policy briefs our academic thinkers tend to think of everything in, in formal jargon in, in they, they write mostly for publication. So a lot of times the policy brief is really just the identical information from their full 200 page report that maybe they pluck out the juiciest parts and put them in the policy brief. But I, I think there, there's an appetite for the policy briefs to be more concise and, and more just sort of straight to the point in simple terms and, and actually put in the hands of the practitioners. So those listening who are our CTED PIs, please take your policy brief seriously. Please share them widely. Um, the main point of doing this research is to get the information into the hands of people who can solve the problems, um, which maybe leads me to my next question. Uh, as I said, academics by training, by just the, the way universities work, their default publication outlet for their information is scholarly journals. Now that has diversified a bit lately with more people are going on podcasts and, and giving interviews to newspapers. But um, I wanted to ask, do any of you, do you read academic journals for your field? Or if not, where do you get your information so that maybe these PIs can, can start sending information to those outlets instead? Yeah, I, I could jump in. Um, sure, so uh, rarely um, will I do deep dive into academic or, or in a very, um, of one or two topics that I personally might be interested in 
um, call it uh, like safe parking for homeless um, or um, or a program that counts um, a certain, you know, that counts e-bikes <laughs> or something like that. Um, other than that, um, there are, um, you know, there are associations for councils of governments in California. There's our sister agencies, other, other MPOs, there are city managers. Um, and then, uh, and then there's the California Transportation Commission really. Um, so I, I mean, I will look at the Transportation Research Board, TRB. That's pretty academic, right? <laughs> um, um, I, so I tend to read the academic journals a little bit more. Um, I do have, uh, I've got my PhD, so I have a little, and do some, you know, history with doing academic research. So I'm straddling these two worlds a little bit more perhaps than some practitioners, but um, I would say the majority of, of my colleagues probably don't read the academic journals. Um, the professional societies are definitely important. Um, so the for me, the American Planning Association is one of my go-to sources for information um, at the national level, as well as at the state and local level. Um, and there are pretty active local level um, chapters of the APA here in the DFW region. And I think um, UTA has been pretty good um, about being involved with those. I think that's a good way to um, do that two-way street um, mutual beneficial information sharing that the panel just before us was talking about. Um, it's, a, it's a place for UTA researchers and other researchers to get their information out, but also to hear about um, potential stakeholders, projects, other opportunities in their region. So I would definitely push those, the local chapters of professional um, organizations and societies. Um, and then, you know, I, I, it's, it's a stat that makes me feel sad, but, you know, people tend to not pay attention for more than what, like a 15 second video clip or sound bite, like our, our attention span collectively has gotten quite short. And so I think a lot more people are getting information from blog posts and other sources like that, that are, um, they're shorter, they tend to have more of a pop culture focus than an academic focus. Um, but there's a lot of, uh, you know, I get a lot of an interesting information from practicing plan practitioner planners or other professionals out there who write blog posts on the side about their pet topics. Um, so that, that's another avenue I would recommend exploring. Uh, for me, with few exceptions, uh, if it's not on the internet and free, I don't see it. So that's pretty much. Yeah, so. You know, the, the paywall piece is really important, right? Like once you graduate from school, you don't have access to all those academic um, journals anymore. Um, it's very hard to get the paymaster to to do that for you. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah, and all of our our projects, they do have a a full formal report. It's a government requirement. It's an exhaustive, in depth report. They take several months to write. Um, those are made publicly available. They're they're in several repositories. But I know from experience. First of all, you have to know where that repository is, and most people are too busy at their job to to learn, you know, an online database that's not super relevant. But then, not many people download them, not many people read them, and they're about two hundred pages long. Um, it's it's hard to get the information, and once you do, it might be in jargon that's not helpful, or it, it might just take a long time to get the information. So, yeah, I think pushing for blogs, podcasts, um, quick intervals of information, which, you know, maybe uh, building on what Dr. Foss said, maybe a, a more pleasant way to, to construct it would be that people are busy. You know, we do have shorter attention spans, but maybe we could, we could like just say, oh, we're, we're too busy to have more than 15 seconds. Um, but that's definitely something for our PIs to think about is, is going beyond the journal publication, beyond the, the fancy report to get this information to people. Um, are there any, oh, here's a question from Dr. Watkins. Uh, what about City Lab or 
news related newsletters. Does anyone follow City Lab on Twitter or read their posts? Yep, I definitely read City Lab. Um, you know, I subscribe to a bunch of kind of weekly e newsletters um, on topics related to rideshare, AVs, um, smart cities, you know, all of those kind of topics. Um, and I don't always read the weekly emails that come through, but I at least try to skim them and kind of see what are the what are the headlines, what are the big things that are happening. And then if there's something that piques my interest, I'll do a deeper dive into it. Um, but yeah, the, I find those digests helpful. You know, um... Um, an important facet to, um, to to reading information is not just what 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 we might read, but but when we have time to read it. So um, and and maybe some insight with communicating with stakeholders uh, might be to familiarize yourself with the cycle, uh, like our programming cycle or our board agenda cycle. Um, it's it's a little bit like Saturday Night Live, in that. Um, we have to spend kind of all week or two weeks preparing for the show uh, and with the show being our board meeting. Uh, now for an MPO, it's like once a month or every month and a half, but for a city, uh, it might be every week, it might be every, every two weeks. Um, so I imagine it's quite a different, it's a different, right? It's a different cycle on campus. So I, I know with, um, you know, Dr. Pandy, when I'm talking to him, that he's either between classes or he's about to start a class or he's not, depending on what the students are going. And we keep tabs on that because we have interns. Um, but but there's still kind of, uh, you know, the cogs of our, our, of our wheels aren't quite timing, but if, you know, somebody astute could just figure that out and communicate with us at a time when, we're, when, we, can, when we can listen, when we can read. Uh, downtime, dead week, you know, then I can read, I can go and read something uh, a bit more thorough. And, and it's, I, I still think it's important to have it because um, it adds validity. Uh, if I can stand on top of academic research, I'm like, come on, guys, I, I, um, I can win my argument with some, I can be more persuasive because I'm standing on something that's more um, legitimate. And sometimes a, a blog or an infographic just might not might not have that um, if you're trying to defend it in front of an elected or, um, you know, like a really elected, like a senator or a congressperson or something. And I guess I, I'm aware oh, of the City yeah. Lab, but I don't subscribe. Um, one last question to kind of round things up. It looks like we're almost out of time. Um, a lot of our audience are junior faculty, postdocs, students people who are just getting sort of set up in, a, in often a new location. So maybe they don't know who to call or which agencies to talk to. Um, and maybe they find stakeholders by Google or by trial and error, but how would you recommend they get in touch with you? Should they stick with the website or, or do your agencies have a specific research channel? Um, should they attend city council meetings? Uh, what are some ideas for, for someone just starting out to, to get their foot in the door? Um, I, I would say use the phone, be aggressive. I mean, not mean, but, you know, um, call us up, you know, chat us up, see what you can do. That, that's pretty much it. Um, yeah, I mean, definitely call, email city folks. It, sometimes it can be hard to find the right person. Um, you know, going to city council meetings is, um, I personally think more people should do it. Um, they, they may look dense um, and same with, with you know, the COG uh, board meetings and, and things like that. Um, they look a little bit dense. The agendas can be somewhat inscrutable until you kind of figure out the, the insider lingo. But once you do, there's a lot of in interesting information in those agendas and, and at those meetings. And it's a good way to learn, you know, who, who the people are, who the people, you know, that care about these types of projects, maybe that you're working on. Um, I mentioned the, the local professional organizations um, already. Um, I, I would also say, you know, get involved with community organizations, find out, you know, is there a project already going on in the community that maybe you could help volunteer with or be a part of, um, 
And that can be a good way to network and get to know other people. Um, and I know we're, we're wrapping up. I just wanted to mention one other thing. I think echoing again, something that was mentioned on the um, previous panel, but um, really aligning timelines and deliverables between the academic research team and the, um, the agency that you're working with at the beginning of the project is hugely important. And, and this goes a little bit to, to what John was just saying, of, you know, like we're on a different cycle in terms of our workload and when we're busy and when we're not compared to the academic calendar. And, you know, often um, we need information for a, a board meeting or a council meeting that's a month away, whereas an academic researcher is thinking in terms of the three or four month long semester. And so um, I think if you can align what, what the timeline is gonna be to reasonably get the work done and what the outputs and deliverables will be ahead of time, I think that ha has made for much more successful partnerships in my experience so far. I just wanted to mention that even though you didn't ask about it specifically. Yeah, I'd, I'd also I'd also say showing up is is probably the most um, impactful way to be uh, assertive um, with uh, um, interacting with us. Um, a, a tip might be to wait until after we've done our particular presentation, um, because if you if you try to introduce yourself like three minutes before the mayor is going to ask us a question or we're going to present we're probably not going to listen to your question but but once we're done uh we're all ears honestly the the pressure's off you know we've we've done our bit um and uh and and whatnot so uh, and I, I do just have one one last thing to to say while we're here is um you know doc, dr pandy alluded to the uh the, the tragedy that occurred out here, um, the 18 year old, I just wanna say his name was uh, Jordan Benjamin Grant of uh, Plano, Texas, was the boy, uh, a young man, 18 year old who was killed in October, 2018. Thank you. Thank you for that. And uh, thank you to our panel for, for giving these really useful insights. I think they'll be very helpful to our, our practitioner to our researchers as they build bridges with practitioners. Um, now I'll, I have to rotate some of the panelists on and before off. Before you do, before you turn their screens off, I just want to say thank you yes. uh, to each one of you for participating in this. Uh, the insight that you've given is uh, so valuable to our investigators. Just hearing that each stakeholder you have to listen to what they want and how they want to be interacted with, how they want to engage and what kind of output they're looking for at the end. It's so good to hear from you all that um, you're interested in working with researchers, I think, if I heard you correctly, but it's really a matter of um, understanding how best to work with you. So thank you so much for being part of this event and sharing that, that information with us. I hope you stick around for the, for the rest of the workshop. Thank you, James. All right, so uh, the last part of this workshop is going to be a discussion. And I have to apologize uh, to the person who's uh, gonna help us with leading this discussion, Dr. Carrie Watkins uh, from Georgia Tech. I had planned to uh, uh, make sure to, say, to introduce Carrie at the beginning. So my apologies, uh, so that she could give everyone a heads up. <laughs> So that, could, that didn't work. I'm, I apologize for that. Um, but we have three individuals who are going to help us with this last discussion uh, part. And so I wanted to introduce those three individuals and then just understand that along with them, there's going to be a handful of stakeholders and researchers or investigators that are part of this whole, whole discussion. But the three primary people who are going to help guide us, uh, Dr. Carrie Watkins, uh, she is the Frederick Law Olmsted Associate Professor in Civil and Environmental Engineering at Georgia Tech. Her research and teaching look at how technology and public space can be used to encourage collective transportation, such as transit and rideshare, and active transportation, such as biking and walking. Uh, next is Dr. Kathy Lee, and I don't see her yet. <laughs> So the and then also James uh, is going to help us with this section as well. Uh, there's Kathy. 
So uh, Dr. Lee is an assistant professor at the UT Arlington School of Social Work. Her primary research goal is to broaden knowledge around mental health and quality of life among vulnerable and marginalized older adults. As a co-investigator, she received a CTED grant to support the health and mobility needs of Hispanic older adults. So um, to Carrie, Kathy, and James, thank you very much for helping us lead this last part of the, of the workshop uh, for this discussion. So I'll turn things over to, to you, Carrie. Thank you. Thanks, Eileen. So um, it's okay. We we were ready for this, so it's good anyway. Um, I am being joined in my little section. I think Eileen kind of explained we were initially supposed to be doing these as breakouts, so it's a little bit different of a format from what we had envisioned. Um, but I'm I'm joined by both some co PIs on a, a project that I'm working on that's led by Suchi Deb, and um, I think Ming Lee might be here as well somewhere. Um, and then Rebecca Davies from uh, People for Bikes. Um, we actually were uh, looking to brainstorm some ideas about um, potential research ideas, as well as better ways for stakeholders or, and researchers to interact. Um, and so uh, we were gonna do this jointly. jointly uh, we're a newer project that's actually focused around bike safety, um, looking at coding apps as is a specialty of Dr. Lee, as well as human factors and understanding how people might react to these things is a specialty of, of Dr. Deb. Um, and I actually do a lot of uh, bike safety work. Um, Rebecca Davies is, was um, our new stakeholder who we're just bringing into the project. Um, she works with People for Bikes. Um, trying to increase uh, bikeability across the nation and possibly the world. I'll let Rebecca speak to that. Um, for everybody else who's listening in, we'd love to have you join in the chat. So um, I think that's the way we're still doing this, Eileen. The big questions that we want to pose to you, our subject is bicycle and pedestrian safety. And we're looking for ideas. If you had the resource of academics with expertise in things like innovative data, uh, coding, human factors, like my co-PIs and I, um, at your disposal, what kind of research would you want to be doing? Um, and to sort of further the discussion from the last group, what things would make it easier to work with academics on research? What, what kinds of things could we be doing to better um, have these uh, relationships work well so that we're we're actually producing research from the beginning that um, folks are gonna be able to react to. So um, Rebecca agreed to be our guinea pig that she would get the conversation going. And um, I'm gonna turn it over to her for a couple of the ideas that she already had thought about. Yeah, thanks so much. I'm um, happy to be joining you all um, and learning about all the great work you're doing. Um, so I thought it'd be interesting to share a question that I received recently um, through a partner of ours um, on, a, on this topic, which was what would be the percentage in terms of reduction of crashes and fatalities if there were full deployment of bicycle to vehicle communication? And I heard that question and I said, well, I, have, I have no idea. <laughs> I really, I don't even know where to start. Um, you know, I'm not. I'm not really sure what full deployment of bicycle to vehicle communication looks like. I, I don't. I don't. That means exactly, or you know, how to envision that. Um, you know, cause to me, that also involves technology that's in motor vehicles and infrastructure technology, and 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 I, you know, and we we spend a lot of time working with cities, advocating for safer road design, and we work with the bike industry um, around a number of a number of um, issues that affect them, including state and national policy, but we don't really have time to be experts on new technology. And so, and to be frank, I don't, I don't have a lot of knowledge on, on the different technologies. And I would think for me starting, trying to start to answer that question would be understanding more about technologies specific to what can be either on the bicyclist or on the bike, <laughs> um, you know, independent of those other systems, like the, the cars, the infrastructure. Um, and, you know, how far can, can that go in somebody being able to take ownership of their safety, given that, you know, they have limited control sometimes over the environment around them. Um, so that, that to me was a, a big question, but being able to start chipping away at it, you know, what just understanding more and understanding better what the potential is of technologies that a bicyclist or a bike could have to um, increase their ability to protect themselves on the road. Okay. 
Um, I, I didn't see anything in the chat yet. I don't know if there's other ways that people can communicate with us that James and Eileen can let us know. Um, but other than that, I would say, Rebecca, do you have other ideas that you would want to bring to the fold? Or uh, Suchi or Ming, do you have questions for Rebecca around um, a proposed research idea like this? Um, well, I, I wanted to, I kind of had a thought actually coming from um, some of the earlier comments in this in this session um, as far as you know working like how um, for us working with researchers you know how that can be most effective and um, I think one of the, we spend a lot of time we actually have a couple of technology projects internally of our own and they really consume quite a lot of our energy and time and anytime we have an opportunity to integrate those with what other folks are doing that really it both it helps us like move our projects forward but also i think gives us a way to highlight what someone else is doing like whether that's research or whether that's a product they're working on or something like that so i think to me that that's often successful is when we can do a little pile and say okay we're produced we're generating data about infrastructure like how can we use that data and combine it with the data you're creating um, in your project and say, is there a way to look at them simultaneously? Because that will help us meet some of our existing objectives while also expanding utility of, you know, what we're, what we're receiving um, in that project from, from external folks. So um, I think that's one opportunity is just identifying kind of what exists there and how can it be plugged in. Um, and also we do a lot of pilots with individual cities and groups. And so um, that's, a resource we have and we try to make the most of and you know when there are opportunities to connect um, people to those pilot cities or groups that we're working with um, I think that can be a really effective way to sort of amplify research and also maybe even find areas to test it test new technologies test you know working with with different groups so those are just a couple of thoughts I had as far as like implementation and being able to um, move our work ahead simultaneously with moving the research ahead. Eileen, I don't know if you need to move on to the next group, but to react to what um, Rebecca is saying, I think one thing we could dive deeper if we have more time is these kinds of pilots are something that I often hear from stakeholders at cities and MPOs and even advocacy organizations like People for Bikes, um, that they would love to be able to evaluate, but they don't have the staff to do so. And I think that that's actually a role that UTCs could fill quite well um, part of the difficulty, though, is the timeline is such, again, like the last panel was talking about, that it's really hard for them to say, you know, we have this pilot that's starting up in two months, and we'd love to have an academic researcher do some before and after data collection. Um, and there's really no way for them, um, it's for us to all react that quickly. So maybe something for CTED to think about going forward is how do we fund these kinds of things with a cycle that would allow organizations to be able to apply for funds so that we could actually ad academically evaluate the kinds of pilots that Rebecca is, is putting in place. I don't know about James, but I'm making a note. So <laughs> uh, was, did one of your, your team members also want to talk uh, to what Rebecca was saying? Any research ideas? And I did put out to the chat as well. Okay, so I was uh, interested when you uh, said that the full implementation of vehicle to cyclist, you know, uh, communication. So uh, we are doing uh, a project where we are just looking at uh, a few things that we just started doing, uh, you know, this vehicle bike communication. And we're trying to put something like just smartphone so that uh, it doesn't add any cost to the cyclist. So that's where we are more concerned that uh, for a vehicle, we can add a lot of you know, safety features because it doesn't matter if we add a few thousand dollars to the cost, right? But for a cycle, it, it's uh, quite difficult because we don't know if the cyclists will like to purchase a very high cost cycle when we try to implement those kind of uh, communication devices in the cycle. Because when we try to collect all the information from the traffic infrastructure, from all the vehicles around, it will be expensive to you know, track all those and uh, have more sensors in the cycle. Uh, it's easier for just the vehicle or the infrastructure to collect them. So that's why we were uh, kind of like interested to know that, do you have any idea uh, that 
if the cyclists in future would like to, you know, uh, purchase this kind of cycles that will include a very pricey or expensive device to have uh, this interaction with uh, their surrounding traffic environment. Um, yeah, I think, you know, we we think about that, yeah, pretty, pretty regularly because um, we also have worked on an app that's more about getting beginner cyclists interested in riding and finding rides near them. Um, and I think it really, I, a lot of, it depends on the type of riding and the type of rider. So is it something that is going to be benefiting a, somebody who does a lot of recreational road riding, in which case they might be spending more on their bikes or spending more, more, more time and more money. They're also gonna be on a lot of routes that aren't necessarily like a multi-use path next to a road because they're going long distances and they're maybe going fast. Um, and so that kind of rider might have more potential than the sort of you know irregular city commuter who isn't going to be thinking that much about this technology on their bike and um, or maybe would if it was it was if it was you know in maybe there's a way to make them more interested or a way that they would be more likely to um, adopt it. But um, yeah, so I think a lot of that is kind of context dependent on the type of rider. Um, and the type of writing they're doing, and um, some are maybe more likely than others. Yeah, it would be interesting to know if we can run a lot of simulation and collect actually data that how much decrease we can show to people in traffic crashes. Maybe that can be helpful in that case, right? Yeah. Yeah, I would also like to add some comments here. So in order to protect the cyclist safety from the technical specs, um, so uh, the virtual X communication that I just mentioned is one type of uh, solution. So the idea is to install the communication modules at the vehicles and the uh, bicycle to allow them to exchange some important information such as the relative positions, um, the relative directions of different entities and to detect any potential collisions. Um, so the, the idea of this vision is quite promising. Um, uh, and, I, and I know that a lot of uh, companies are actually actively um, like doing research on this to a topic and even developing their own uh, modules. Uh, so uh, one concern that, uh, that I read from a lot of uh, literature is that um, you probably need to have all the entities, including all the bicycles and the vehicles to install such uh, modules to make sure that everyone is uh, in this ecosystem. So everyone is uh, included. Otherwise, you always need to uh, pay attention to the outliers who are still out of the loop, still who do not have their uh, communication module installed. Um, but I mean, probably in the next, uh, a uh, couple of years or even 10 years when more and more uh, bicycles and vehicles are installed with those modules. So the idea of the V2X communication can uh, play a more um, important role to protect the uh, cyclists and safety. Um, and the, another type of uh, approach, uh, which Shuchi just mentioned just now, is to develop uh, various sensing technologies to, uh, to allow the uh, the bicycle to sense the surroundings to detect if there's any uh, pending uh, collisions or any potential hazards. Um, so actually this is what the vehicle companies are doing. They are trying to install more and more sensors, different types of sensors on the vehicles um, and to make sure that all every detail, every um, like, uh, instance will be forecasted uh, it just not sure, we're not sure whether it, it would be a good solution for the bicycle because the cost would be a uh, might be a restriction because comparing the cost of the bike itself, the cost of the sensors like the lidar or like a very sophisticated sensors, those kind of cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, so speaking of, speaking of the uh, ongoing research that Carrie, Shuji, and I are working on, which is part of I see that, is that we're trying to develop uh, like an app on the smartphone, utilizing the built-in sensors on the smartphone, uh, like the speakers, uh, the microphones. We turn the smartphones into a small radar, 
and to, to sense the surroundings and to detect if we can, uh, if there's any potential clinicians uh, so that we can generate various kinds of alerts um, for the cyclists to avoid uh, the collision. Yeah, I, I can. Thank you. So because of our time, I think this is a good discussion. That was kind of what we wanted to be able to do was try to facilitate a good discussion, but unfortunately our time is short. So uh, we are gonna go to our next uh, topic. So that's one topic, bike and pedestrian safety. Uh, hopefully everyone can connect and exchange messages as well. We're gonna shift over to our second topic, which is equity and social reform. And I'll turn it over to Kathy Lee. Um, yeah, sure. Um, so I invited uh, Dr. Shi Won Zhang from University of South Florida, and she and I um, worked on the healthy body program that supports Hispanic older adults in our community to meet their needs uh, and mobility and transportation needs. And I also invited our community partners, um, Katie Dickinson from the Senior Source and Imelda Aguera from Dallas Latino Resource Coalition, and she also works for the Alzheimer's Association. So I want to open up the conversation uh, to understand what needs do you think our marginalized and vulnerable community members have in terms of transportation and mobility? So I might want to start uh, with some background information our, about our program Healthy Body. Um, we did the English version as a pilot to increase the seniors' mobility in the community who do not drive anymore. So it was pretty much successful, even though it was a small size pilot. So we were lucky to secure the funding from CTAD to expand the program to Hispanic uh, older adult community. But unfortunately, the COVID hit once we started the program. But we were able to uh, convert the format from the uh, in-person version to the online version. So we did almost all like uh, pieces of the program via online, like using uh, telecommunication, all available platforms. But it was really hard. But what we learned from this uh, unexpected uh, situation was they are more, they got more vulnerable when they got faced into this type of unexpected disasters. Mm -hmm. So they were just lost what to do. And they were extremely uh, curious about how they could get the vaccines. At that point, they were not able to get any information, especially they were not good at speaking or understanding English. So our team was uh, able to have translator, professional translator, and we just translated all like ongoing information like day by day and try to share the information with our members and they really appreciate it. So I thought that um, our efforts needs to be continued even after the COVID to work with this marginally disadvantaged people, including the uh, seniors. Also, in many cases, we have resources in the community, especially my research center, Cutter. We have been working hard to help out those people who are under transportation disadvantaged. But when we, I'm originally from public health, so when I go out to the community to work with um, community partners, they do not know where their, their resources are. So that was the point we started thinking about how we could connect the existing resources and the people who are in need of that type of resources. So it was a great experience, including the COVID um, period. And I really appreciate that CTED was there to support our research, research effort to uh, improve the transportation equity. So as a pro public health professional, it was kind of hard to secure funding to help out those seniors in the community. But CTED was there and understood our um, like big plan and our intention, and it worked really well. So I look forward to uh, expanding the program with Dr. Kathy Lee. And yeah, hopefully the program gets like expanded to other uh, communities 
maybe internationally, nationally. That's our big um, permanent goal. So we are working hard to make it happen. And thank you for this time to share our experience and thoughts. So yeah, during the research, we realized that uh, even like when we try to understand their transportation needs, actually our Hispanic older adults address their strong needs in terms of um, access to healthcare um, and so on. So how about you, Katie and um, Imelda, how about your experience? I think that quite often what is forgotten with older adults is that uh, public transportation is their only transportation. Mm -hmm. And if public transportation is not available, then they have no transportation. Um, you know, I, I've loved listening to all the people talk about things about bikes and pedestrians, and that's wonderful for other age groups, but for the 85-year-old, it's probably not going to be the solution. I think at the same time, the pandemic has really brought um, into everyone's uh, eyes, eyes that the problem, one of the problems we have is also older adults have a more limited access to technology. So, uh, and I think that was brought home more than anything by people trying to get vaccines. It wasn't that older adults didn't want vaccines. It was that they did not have a way to register when the only way to register was through the internet. Um, but that's really kind of my feeling is for older adults, public transportation is not a luxury. It's the only thing they have. Right. Or not only that, um, Katie, but also we see the same group, um, the older adults rely on, they may not even know how to, how to use public transportation mm -hmm. because of the language barrier. They may not feel comfortable and many of them um, you know, may feel even scared to, to go out, especially in the climate that we have seen during COVID and even prior to COVID. But um, they rely on friends and they rely on their family to drive them. And many times they, their friends and family may not be available or they have to schedule or, uh, so I just wanted to point that out as well, because that's something that we have seen even prior to COVID. Uh, that there's a lot of reliance on friends and family for the older adults to get around. Um, so for those that don't have any, you know, that don't have close ties to folks with cars, what do they do? Mm -hmm. And I think Imelda really hit it on, the nail on the head when she was talking about safety, because that is one thing that, that really does concern me about older adults. To ride the bus in an area like Dallas you might have to walk as much as a half a mile to get to the bus stop. Mm -hmm. So um, is it safe to do that? When you get there, is there gonna be any shelter? Uh, how long are you gonna to have to wait? So safety becomes a very high priority. We do have paratransit, but it cannot address the needs of all the older adults that we see. And yes, Imelda's right. At the end of the day, so many are dependent upon their children who have to take off from work. Mm -hmm. Right. I'm so glad that, you know, it's at the end, it's also like related to how like even pedestrian safety and general infrastructure um, can be shaped to support these marginalized and vulnerable populations in our community. So um, I know that we are kind of running out of time. So maybe Aileen, you want to move on to general infrastructure? I'm going to let James take it. Yes. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yes. Actually, it, it looks like we won't have enough time to do a separate session, but um, I, I think I can speak for Mr. DeVault as well with a little bit of suggestion or, or reminder to our researcher audience and student audience. It's first, as we've heard from, from the practitioners here, remember your basics. You know, a, a study doesn't always have to be 
a moonshot of, of magical innovation and technology. Technology is wonderful and it solves problems, but a lot of our everyday lives are still basic issues of access and affordability. And that you know, should be a part of your research. It's okay to, to focus on the basics and to get things into the hands of ordinary people. And I think the other part, which I'm a, a qualitative researcher, I used to work with groups just like the senior source, is um, an issue that's difficult for researchers to do, but they really should try, is uh, what qualitative scholars call embeddedness. And it's to try to become a part of the community that you're studying. It's, it's an anthropology concept, basically live amongst the tribe. And in, in a policy or an engineering construct, that might mean if you're studying a transit system, ride the transit system. If, if you're studying bridges, go see the bridge and touch it and walk on it. Or if you're developing a, an app like Dr. Ming Li, you know, try to experience what it might be like to be visually impaired or to, to be an older adult in as much as you're able. Uh, you can't simulate some things, but try to, to forge that connection to the problems and the infrastructure that you're studying so that it's not just academic, but that it's actually a part of your life for a few months while you're writing these reports. Um, that, that was always good advice for me. I, I hope people can find a way to fold that into their studies. But um, I think uh, that's all I've got. If anyone else has anything before we close it out. Thank you to all of you. I, I wish we had more time, but I will also, I'll put in the chat another contact information so that uh, to continue these types of discussions or to make new connections if somebody wants to reach out, then uh, C. Ted, myself, James, we will help you get connected. Kathy, thank you so much. And thank you to Imelda and Katie and all of your participants who, uh, who joined us today. Thank you. Andrew, thank you. I'm sorry we didn't get to general infrastructure. <laughs> That's all the time we had for that part of the workshop. So I'm going to turn it over back over to James, but thank you so much for letting us letting us have this time. Just having to uh, shuffle people around. And uh, our next speaker is uh, Terry Schultz. And uh, I'm sorry, I'm not quite sure Terry's formal title or office. I'll let her introduce herself. <laughs> Well, I'll, I'll, I'll say okay. Terry is the director for UT Arlington's uh, Office of Innovation and Commercialization. So she is the one who manages basically all of UTA's intellectual property licensing, all of that. But she's also just very familiar. She is a lawyer, has experience in industry, and so really understands the world of technology transfer. And uh, although he, um, that, I guess that's all I'll say. So Terry, <laughs> uh, please take it away. Okay, great. Um, I'm, I have some slides, so I will share those right now. Did those share? What happened? I don't see your slides. You may need to go into slide mode first and then share your screen. Um, I can't even find you now. <laughs> <laughs> well, there you are. Can you, can you see them now? We see your PowerPoint screen, but not the slideshow. Okay, let me see. Does that work? Still see the same thing. If you stop sharing and then start the slideshow and then share, that might work. Okay. Uh, okay, so I apologize. No problem. <laughs> How's that? Perfect. I see the Awesome. Slide. Now I know the trick on that. So hi, everybody. Yes, as Eileen said, I am Director of Innovation and Commercialization at UT Arlington. I am a registered patent attorney, and I have been at UTA for almost eight years. In a couple of weeks, it'll be eight years. Before that, I was in the legal department of a pharmaceutical company um, for 12 years, and before that, I was in a law firm, so I've kind of been in every setting. And I'm just here to briefly talk about intellectual property and how 
universities um, approach intellectual property created by research conducted at the university. So my starting point is actually the Baidol Act, which some of you may have heard of, others might not have, but the Baidol Act was passed in 1980. And what it did on a high level was give universities ownership of and title to inventions made by researchers at universities using federal funding. Um, the government gets a royalty-free license to practice it, which I think the government almost never does. Um, and then because the universities own the, the IP, the university can license it and receive income from that IP if it's commercialized. And then the university kind of as a trade-off under the act, the university shares those revenues with the inventors or the university scientists who are inventors of that IP. So before Baidol went into effect, um, the federal government was funding research in universities, but what happened with the inventions was that they were owned by the federal government. So the universities really had no control over what happens with those inventions. Um, the government might have licensed that IP as the owner, although as it turns out, um, just before the Baidol Act, the government owned over 28,000 patents and had licensed less than 5% of those to industry for development of commercial products. So university research was not getting to the public. Um, and that's why Baidol was passed um, to give universities incentive to develop technology and to get it to the market. So since the passage of Baidol, go to the next slide. Um, universities have spun off more than 4,000 companies and this data is probably a few years old. Um, there are FDA approved vaccine drugs, new indication for existing drugs, et cetera, that have come from research done by universities using federal funding. Um, in 2012, there were 591 new products originating from university research. So, and, and even startups, startup companies based on university IP and research, you know, have formed out of universities and gone on to successfully commercialize university technology. So that's why Biodol exists. That's why universities own IP and that's why universities have tech transfer offices. There were a few, before Baidol, but really tech transfer offices really um, came to be after Baidol. And that's partly because there are reporting requirements. So when an in in invention is created using federal funding, the university is obligated to report that to the funding agency. And that's the fun one of the functions of the tech transfer office. Um, so, and tech transfer offices have kind of broadened that existence to not only exist because of federal funding, but also to manage any inventions that are created at the university. And generally the tech transfer office will help with compliance of those contractual, um, those contractual obligations under federal grant contracts and sponsored research agreements by reporting to the federal government and often in sponsored research agreements, there's also a reporting requirement to um, report inventions created under that sponsored research. Um, there are also inventions created at universities that might not have a reporting obligation that go along with them, but the tech transfer office is responsible for managing all of that IP, at least at UTA and I think at most other institutions that have a tech transfer office. So how does it work at UTA, for example? And this is pretty consistent for all universities. Um, UT Arlington is a UT system institution. So UT system has 13 institutions and um, is governed by the University of Texas system. 
and all IP created at every one of those institutions is owned by the Board of Regents of UT system. So the IP policy actually states that the Board of Regents automatically owns the IP that's created by employees of the institution essentially, and anyone using the facilities or resources of the institution. And that automatic is important. So that means at the moment of its creation, it's already owned. There's not a subsequent, it's not, it, it doesn't happen subsequently. It happens at the moment of its creation. We do have inventors sign assignment documents acknowledging that it has already been assigned because those are recorded with the patent offices, but it's an automatic assignment. And another part of the IP policy is that before IP owned by the Board of Regents is publicly disclosed, it should be, the policy actually says shall, but should be disclosed to the tech transfer office to determine whether there's patent, patentable subject matter that needs to be protected. Now, I will say that my office's um, policy or approach to that is, you know, we're not here to get in the way of publication. We recognize that publication is an important part of the academic life, and um, we're not going to try to delay that or prevent that from happening. We just wanna make sure if a patent application needs to be filed before a public disclosure in order to preserve um, the ability to obtain a patent that you know, we get some advance notice that a manuscript has been submitted or a presentation is going to be made or something like that so that we can do what we need to do to get something on file to protect that IP. And then another part of the IP policy, which is a part of, I think, all university IP policies under because of the BIDL requirements, is that licensing income received um, or any revenue received from commercializing the technologies created at the university is shared with the inventors or the creators. And the UT system policy states there's a little bit of leeway for the, each individual institution. Um, stage 30 to 50% is shared with the inventors or the creators. Um, at UTA, we consistently share 50% of the revenues with our um, creators. So when we're um, contracting with industry, um, what's the default on the IP ownership in those contracts? Um, for example, in sponsored research or something like that. The default is usually that ownership follows inventorship. And if nothing is said in the agreement about how you handle IP created under the agreement, that's generally gonna be how it's handled is um, any inventor who is obligated to assign to the university, um, that ownership will be with the university, in our case, with UT system. Any inventors that may be from the sponsor, if they're listed as inventors on an, a resulting patent application, they would presumably have the obligation to assign to their employer, the sponsor, and so the sponsor would have ownership of those rights. So that's typically how it's stated in our sponsored research agreements. We also do add in our sponsored research agreements um, some provisions that if IP is created, the university will disclose that IP that results from that funding from the sponsor. We will notify the sponsor that IP has been created. And then the sponsor generally has, um, it's essentially a first right to negotiate a license to that IP. Most of the time it's in, um, the way it works is there's a notice, a notification that IP has resulted. The sponsor has a period of time to say, we're interested in that IP. We would like you to file patent applications and we will pay for those patent applications. And then you have another period of time that is basically an option period where you have the, the parties negotiate a license to the sponsor of that resulting IP. So it might result in a license agreement of the IP that the university owns. There's also, um, just to mention, there, there's usually a publication um, provision in those agreements that will state um, the university 
must have the, the right to publish. We cannot um, in any way inhibit that right to publish for our researchers. Um, we can allow a sponsor to review a draft manuscript and um, ask that any of the company's confidential information be removed if it's, if it's there, but otherwise um, we, we can't give approval rights or disapproval rights and um, we must have the, the, um, the right to publish. And that language is also in our license agreements. But I do wanna say that all of that being said, that um, the UT system IP policy does kind of address some situations. So that's kind of the default, that's the general rule, that's how we deal with sponsored research. There's some leeway to be creative in our, um, our, our dealings with industry um, and sponsored research. So just some excerpts from the IP, UT system IP policy that kind of support that idea. In the preamble, it states that um, UT system institutions will strive to enable the ease of IP creation, protection, management, and transfer to the private sector and society with an environment that promotes the highest quality and integrity of activity, academic activity, teaching, and research. So the, um, to support that, so we wanna make it easy to create IP, to protect it, manage it, and to transfer it to the private sector. There are some um, fundamental principles that underlie the, the policy, the UT system policy. And each institution in, within the UT system has IP policies that are aligned with UT systems policy. And the fundamental principles include successful deployment of IP to make it available to the public. So the successful deployment allows for it to be disseminated for the benefit of the public and in compliance or in alignment with the mission of the system and the institution. So all system institutions will encourage and strengthen university industry partnerships, efficiently and expeditiously manage IP created from those partnerships and be flexible and open to circumstances and the needs of our sponsors. So we recognize that our sponsors have expectations and um, have desires on how IP might be dealt with. And so we want to, to the best of our ability and authorization, make that work. Because commercialization of technology enhances the reputation of the system and enables a transformation of knowledge into the marketplace. Um, and we will comply with federal laws and state laws because we're, um, we are formed under the laws of the state of Texas. We are a state entity and it looks like I'm out of time. So I will, I guess, stop there and see if there are any questions um, from there. Hey, Terry. Um, yeah, we were just running a few minutes behind, but that's okay. Um, I don't see any questions just yet, but I do want to emphasize to people that since CTED is a multi-university uh, center, what a lot of what, obviously what Terry was talking about was general federal law and the implications of why universities do technology transfer in the first place. So that's ap widely applicable. And a lot of what she's talking about, each of your universities will have similar offices and information and um, there's a lot of similarity between across across universities and whether they're public or private, I'm sure there's a lot of differences, but um, please understand that your technology transfer office is there to help you and to help walk you through all of this that um, and, and to make sure that you can get your technology out into society. Um, I guess Absolutely. one point just to emphasize is that since a lot of the CTED work can also be policy oriented. Um, I'm sure there's additional things in there, Terry, that have to do with more of maybe copyright or um, other, there's other things to intellectual property than just making a new device, right? Yeah, and um, that is true, Eileen. And for copyright, um, I think most universities' ownership policy there is that, um, well, I know that UTAs and I think all UT system institutions policies are that the 
faculty member owns the copyrights to their scholarly works. So publications, um, books, those kinds of things. Okay. Um, to the extent that it's a commercializable entity, for example, software that is owned by the university or board of regents, but scholarly works, copyrights to so those kinds of things, creations like artistic creations, that sort of thing, that's owned by the creator or the faculty member under our IP policy. And so there have been instances where sponsors have asked for assignment of copyright or something like that in um, sponsored research agreements or collaboration type agreements. And my answer is always UT, UT system or UTA doesn't own that right in order to give you that. So we just don't have that right to sell it. We don't own that car, we can't sell it to you. You've got to deal with the faculty on that one. So, yeah. Okay. Well, I'll stop sharing. Terry, I appreciate you being able to address this audience and hopefully it gives the investigators a little bit more to think about and keep in mind uh, before they uh, uh, start a relationship with some of their stakeholders. So thank you very much, Terry. Thank you.